I suppose that one of the most extraordinary things about the whole case was the voice. Now, this voice was quite something. And how it started was this. On December the 10th, 1977 we're talking about, I was sitting in the room, in the, in the front room there, downstairs, with the mother and the children, and we were just talking, and suddenly there was whistling and going on. And I thought, that's funny, it's very sophisticated whistling. The children can't whistle like that. It sounds like the whistling that Mr. Nottingham does. He whistles quite a bit next door, but he's not there, he's at work. I thought, crazy. Suddenly, a dog barked in the room. Hmm, fine, a dog barked in the room. But there was no dog there. I thought, well, you know, this is even crazier still. And I began to think, you know, okay, it can whistle, it can bark. And the thing began to turn around in my head. And it went on quite a bit. Then, lunchtime, about lunchtime, Guy Playfair came along and I said to Guy, this morning I heard a dog barking and whistling in the room and there was no dog there. And I said, it was a dog barking. Well, he took everything in his stride, he always did. And we decided then that if it could bark and it could whistle, it may be out of talk. And I said to Guy, well, I'll tell you what, if it happens this evening, I'm going to take the children into the bedroom by themselves and see whether it can talk. Now this was the day that nine other investigators, most of them scientists, were in the house. So we had quite a lot of people who heard the first noise that was made. About six o'clock in the evening, and everybody was there, got the barking and whistling away. Round about nine o'clock, if I remember rightly, I said to Mrs. Hodson, can I take the children upstairs? I want to do an experiment. She said, okay, I mean, she's used to it by now, she's used to everything. So I took the children upstairs and they got into bed, and in the next bedroom, in the small box room, Guy Playfair was there with his headphones on and we put a microphone in, in the room I was in with the children so he could hear all what was going on. Uh, and the barking and whistling was going on. Then I suddenly said, if you can bark and you can whistle, you can talk. Say my name. For quite a while, nothing happened. And suddenly it said, Maurice. I thought, good. <laughs> good, some results. And then I challenged it again. I said, no, that's not my name, because I didn't hear it properly, you see. It was like Maurice, something like that. So I said, no, say it again. This time it said, Maurice, quite clearly. Then I challenged it to say, say Dr. Belloff. Dr. Belloff, one of my colleagues, was there that, that night. He's a very famous parapsychologist. And it said, Dr. Bella. So I knew that we had a voice. Now, what was this voice? How did it work? First of all, when it started to speak, I thought we had uh, a discarnate voice, what we call discarnate voice, a voice coming from nowhere out of the air. Then I began to realize when I watched the children more carefully, or watched Janet particularly more carefully, it was seen to be coming from her direction. Now, her lips weren't moving, her, li her mouth wasn't moving. Her lips, a slight tremble on her lips, but that's all. But I noticed when the voice spoke, her chest went up and down. So I watched her very carefully. And then, after a while, I challenged her and I said, Janet, that voice is coming from you. She said, oh no, it's not. I said, yes, it's coming from you, Janet. She says, not. I said, if it's not coming from you, where is it coming from? She says, coming from behind me. I said, uh, you sure? She said, absolutely certain. That voice is not coming from me, it's coming from behind me. So we did a test later on, sometime later. We did a, just a simple test, not terribly scientific, but a simple test. We put a microphone in front of her throat, one on the back of her neck. And we found that the one on the back of her neck was louder than the one on her throat. Shouldn't be so. These teenage sisters believe they're haunted well. by a poltergeist. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred the voices. I know the joke. How uh, many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had ten Three. Um, sensible voices. 
but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. I feel to be haunted by a poltergeist. It's not haunted. Shut up. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. Does it frighten you, the things that happen here? Oh, well, it did first, but now I've got more oh, used to it. And you learn to accept the things that happen. It's slanger covered it, Mum. My idiot, Mum. Slanger bookshelf at Mum. Yeah. Have you tried telling it to go away? Yes, yeah. many times. No, it's nothing. And what does it reply? Mm. No, well, it won't. It's day another six, seven years. What about the voices? When? When did the voices start? December the 12th. December the 12th? Yes. And how did they start? Well, one night Mr. Grove was talking about it about 8.30. He said, all we need now is the voices to talk. And that night I went to bed and I can't remember exactly what happened. Um, What's that knocking? Yeah, that's. You can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning and Peggy was on her own. So she came in to us because you know, it wasn't her, she came in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down my knocks and there was 14 altogether. And it's doing it again now. That was three knocks just now? Yes, it goes in threes and twos. How we first got contact with this was when Mr. Gross said, if there's anyone there, knock twice for yes, and if not, one for no. I wonder if we did that now, whether it would answer. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? It doesn't always do it to order. No, it doesn't. It goes in spasms. Like we're talking now. It may not now, after you've said that, but you won't do it when you want it to straight away. No. What about the voices? They sometimes um, say things and make answers. Mm. Is that the voice now? Yeah. Is anybody there? How many voices are there? No. Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart Thurton. Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart, Stuart Thurton. Thurton. Oh, has he ever spelt that for you? No. Mr. Gross asked him, but it's like distract Mr. Gross last night when he asked, or some time ago. And what, what do you think these are? Are they people or are they just voices? Could be spirits, oh, I don't know. No, I believe it's a Ghosts form of a spirit something. speaking for us somehow. No. We don't get this at school, these voices are. Because I believe when we're all separate, it's not so strong. Just when you come nearer each other? Yeah, like here, or our aunts, we will up there together, or in Peggy's. It's still. And Janet, your voice is stronger, isn't it? It seems mm. to be the strongest. Yeah. Does when you hear the voice and it comes out, where does it come from? Here, your throat. No. Where do you feel it comes Back from? Back of the neck. Mm. Back of the neck. And so it must be as if it's somebody else speaking then, when you hear yeah, it. Yeah, behind us. And do you get the feeling when you hear the voice that there is a person there? Yes. Yeah. And do they tell you much about themselves? Not really, no. They just tend to growl and... and play around and sort of joke and be silly. No. I wonder 
Do you think there's anyone there just now? Yeah. I do. Who's that? What? Who's that, Janet? Pardon? Stuart Certain. Stuart Certain, and he's one of the voices? Yeah. Why do you think he comes and speaks through you? To noise, to win noise. Does he ever say anything nice? Well... Don't know, really. Shall we try and speak to him? No. We'll see if he'll speak to us. Yeah. Is anybody there? No, no. Who's there? Doctor. Doctor who? Chases here. Uh, in Enfield, and uh, here you see Margaret and her mother, who were very, very involved in this case. You remember the day I first came? Yes, I remember. Yeah, Mr. I Gross. Remember and, and, and you was on the case ever since then. Yeah. yeah. Onwards, and you saw everything mm. and took note and explained to us. You remember when the reporters and journalists were here? How did they carry on? I could see the fear in some of their faces also, and they probably could sense that we was dead scared and wanted to run out any minute. I know I did. Yeah. I My sister did, I know that. I remember one of them came in and he explained to me that I'd got a poltergeist in the house. And, and I said, well, I know it's that. And I nearly fainted when he told me. I didn't even know what it was. In fact, I don't think any of us did. And we couldn't even until say afterwards. the word poltergeist until Mr. Groves from the Psychical Research explained how to say poltergeist. That's me, that's me. <laughs> and, and, and also, what it actually meant in, was it German? Was it? Yeah, it, it, poltergeist, it, noisy, noisy, noisy ghost. Noisy spirit. In the meaning noisy of it thing, also, yeah. which he explained to us. What do you say to people who say to you, with you children playing around, what do you say about well, that? I say that's a matter of opinion. If you haven't experienced it, you're going to say that. But it did really happen. It upsets me deep down to think that they can't give us an open mind, the ones that just put it down completely. But all I can say to them is I wish they could experience the same thing as what we went through. They certainly wouldn't say it was false or a fake or it was child play. It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet, before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't. It didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. Discuss. So, nearly 35 years ago, a normal family was thrust into the limelight thanks to the weird and very strange goings-on of an alleged ghost or poltergeist causing havoc in their home. The story made news across the country, changing the Hodgson's lives forever. So, was 284 Green Street in Enfield, North London, the most haunted house in Britain? On the 31st of August 1977, the ghostly goings-on at an ordinary semi-detached council house in Enfield in North London made national headlines. 284 Green Street was home to the Hodgson family and, it's claimed, the Enfield poltergeist. For just over a year, a series of bizarre events took hold in the house, including flying furniture, levitation, and even family members dragged from their beds by some kind of force. They lifted right over the double bed. 11-year-old Janet Hodgson seemed to be the centre of the activity, and eerie photographs appear to show her being flung across her bedroom. But many questioned whether it was all a hoax. Now, over 30 years later, the case continues to intrigue and baffle in equal measure.
And Janet joins us now, along with poltergeist expert and investigator Guy Lyon Playfair and uh, skeptic and author Deborah Hyde. And welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you. Now, I know, um, Janet, you don't do very many interviews on, on this subject. You've sort no. of put that behind you now. So thank you very much indeed for coming today to take part in this and reliving this extraordinary time of your life. So your, your mum uh, is Peggy, a single mum, and, uh, and lived at uh, 284 Green Street. Uh, this is the late 1970s, um, and you've got Margaret, who was 12 at the time, and then there was you, 11, and then there was Johnny, who's 10, and Billy, who was 7. Um, so what was the first time something strange happened in this house? Um, well, me and my brother, we were sitting down to bed one evening, and we could hear this shuffling noise. And mum coming because she could hear us shouting and screaming. And we said that the chest of drawers was moving towards the bedroom door. Mm -hmm. So she said, oh, don't be silly. But she see it move for herself. And then at one point, she couldn't push it back. And then, then she got quite upset and said, right, if we run downstairs. Well, you went to get a neighbor, didn't you? That's right. Vic, yes. Vic Nottingham was the was the neighbour who was a who was a builder. That's right. And he came in and uh, and it scared him so much that he scarpered. Mm -hmm. And then you were uh, called in the police and we've got um, WPC Caroline Heap saw a chair move. She said at the time a large armchair moved unassisted four feet across the floor. This is the police. Eventually the officers left, um, telling you that the incidents were not a police matter and you couldn't find anyone breaking the law. Mm -hmm. uh, what they were doing it was um, was these events, whatever they were, were were, were frightening you terribly well, because they right. progressed and got worse and worse. Mm -hmm. um, so what else happened? What else do you remember of that time? Furniture turning over. Cups filled with water, fires igniting on oven gloves and matches where part of the box or the oven glove would burn but it would go out. Um, voices, levitation, um, just, and at one point the most frightening thing was when a curtain wrapped itself around my neck next to my bed. So it felt, for you, as an 11 year old, this felt malevolent. It felt very unfriendly. It did, yeah. I mean, there was times when it was fascinating mm. to see, but when it was happening to you, like the levitation, the voices, well, we've got a picture of um, uh, uh, here of uh, well, taken by the newspaper uh, mm -hmm. photographer, and this is of you sort of flying through through the air. And at the time, people were saying, "Well, you just just jumped off the bed," mm -hmm. um, but uh, but you say that's not the case. You didn't just jump off the bed. No. What happened? What were the circumstances surrounding that photo? Well, I was in bed, and it was like I felt cold hands, and there was like a force that sort of pulled me out of bed. And sometimes I'd be pulled to my bedroom door, sometimes I'd be pulled up into the air. How come, how come the newspaper journalist was, was taking a picture of you whilst you were in your bed? Did you just, did it, did you just fly, he happened to be there at the time? No, he didn't. He wasn't there at the time, no. It was, the camera was on continuous drive. I see, so it was recording all the time. Yes. And that was, I see. Mm -hmm.